I can hear you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you so much for being all here. Yes. So, uh, yes, my presentation today is going to be called Capitalism and Capitalism Human Face. I will try to stay close to the script. There is like some uh, echo in the recording. I can hear myself. Is that normal? I suppose it is. Uh, I can still hear myself. No, it's better, actually. Okay, I think it's solved. Thank you. Uh, so I will st start to stay close to the paper, to the writing paper. I usually don't do that. I usually improvise, but, uh, you know, like for translation um, proficiency, I will promise that I'll try to, to stay as faithful as possible. So uh, I wanted to begin by saying that uh, on May 31, 1988, uh, during a visit to the USSR, President Ronald Reagan gave an address in front of uh, students of the Moscow University. And uh, in this address, he stood in front of the mural of the October Revolution. And he came there to speak of a different revolution, the digital revolution. And the president said that like a chrysalis, we are emerging from the economy of the industrial revolution, an economy confined to the, and limit, limited by the earth's physical resources into what one economist titled this book, the economy in mind in which there are no bounds on human imagination and the freedom to create is the most precious nat natural resource. And he continued by invoking the ancient wisdom of the Bible, concluding, in the beginning was the, the spirit, and it was from the spirit that the material abundance of creation issued forth. So fast forward to today, uh, to our own decade, and we are no longer living Reagan's dream. The ethos of the tech industry transmogrified in recent years, shifting from the market besotted optimism championed by Bill Gates to the digital feudalism represented by Bay Area neo-reactionaries and cyber monarchists. Crypto-fascist forums, which incubated in tech culture and seem to have compromised it beyond redemption, play a major role in the production and dissemination of alt-right idioms and imagery. According to Mother Jones, the neo-Nazi website Daily Stormer by the way, Daily Stormer ceased to exist because it was finally took, uh, taken off offline after the Charlottesville attack and murder of uh, um, a person, a young girl called Ether Hires, named after the Sturmer, which was the unofficial propaganda organ of the Nazi party in Germany, gets the bulk of its donations from Silicon Valley and Santa Clara County, home to Apple and Intel, which are the site's lar largest traffic source. The most salient feature of the far-right movement, which became known as the alt-right, is thus its relation with information technologies, rather than with the diminished expectations of the post-industrial working class. This, I would argue, points to a new configuration of fascist ideology taking shape under the edges of and or working in tandem with neoliberal governance. So if every rise of fascism, and maybe let's uh, start sharing my screen. So if every rise of fascism bears witness to a failed revolution, one could say that the rise of reprofascist tendencies within the tech industry bears witness to the failures of the digital revolution, whose promises of a post-scarcity economy and socialized capital never came to pass. From this perspective, the mix of cyber obscurantism, far-right esoterica, and paranoid ideation so popular online could be read as the morbid symptom of this ongoing transformation. Geopolitically speaking, the present moment could be defined by a process of de-Westernization, with the West rapidly losing its position of dominance, 
and by the emergence of China as the probable victor in the ongoing dispute over control of the colonial extraction matrix. The survival of Western hegemony hinges on the digital economy, or more precisely, on the development of artificial intelligence, which is the only fast growing sector at present and the sole compelling attempt to project another phase of capitalist accumulation beyond the already exhausted neoliberal one. The cultural wars distort this geopolitical conjecture into a moral parable, the creature about to emancipate itself from the creator. In other words, they represent capitalism with an Asian face. And I just wanted to show a couple of images that can give you like an idea of uh, how this transformation expresses itself aesthetically. So uh, this is a style, an internet style popularly known as vaporwave. And this vaporwave style combines images of Greco-Roman marbles with throne-like Greeks, pastel colors and palm trees, tying the mythical origin of Western civilization to the American dream and tech industry. Riffing on nostalgia, vaporwave could be described as a pastiche, which incorporates new age elements into a retro tech style, mixing the aspirational, the spiritual and the technological. The vaporwave genre was sub uh, subsequently appropriated by the white ethno-nationalist movement, spawning the visual subgenre fashwave. In the next image, you can see a fashwave meme with Black Sun or Sonnenrad that was used by Heinrich Himmler and made popular with esoteric white supremacist circles. So this is the Sonnenrad. Uh, Fash wave meme. And uh, this is another one that points to the theme of a neo Renaissance, so a rebirth of the West. Uh, this is another fash wave meme, just, if, just opposing Arno Brecker. Arno Brecker was, uh, you know, like the sculpture that was the most popular in the National Socialist Movement in Germany. And uh, in the meme, in the internet meme, his image is just opposed to the Celtic cross that was a symbol used by several white supremacist groups, among which the Aryan nations. Uh, in this, the, em the image becomes very apparent in its meaning because, uh, you know, like uh, the uh, slogan, the West is burning, is just opposed to a Celtic cross. So a lot, arguably too much, is currently written about artificial intelligence. The technology poses real economic and social challenges, namely risks of massive job losses and misinformation spread. But these are not the concerns that agitate the mainstream. Instead, industry insiders regularly warn that the technology they are building can pose an existential threat to humanity. There's an element of drama to narratives of human extinction that exists in excess of what the technology can afford. And this connotes fantasies that are far older than the technology. However unscientific, these speculations are not necessarily wrong or false. In fact, they might have little to say about technology, science, or the economy but they do have a lot to say about whiteness and Western hegemony or the loss thereof. So among the problems worth discussing is how chat GPT is programmed to mislead researcher. And a recent published exchange between Gavin De Becker with chat GPT about the former classified national security memorandum 200 titled the Kissinger Report shows that chat GPT constantly mis misleads the researcher in an apparent attempt to cover up US government policy that is considered too controversial. But the digital economy also changes the processes through which technology is accumulated as capital. And the resulting class relation is at odds with the social reproduction of the American way of life. To let the private sector, that is, 
Amazon, Google, uh, DeepMind, Facebook, IBM, and Microsoft function as the sole providers of essential public services implies a fundamental division between the tax savvy gentry and the vast underclass of underemployed or precariously employed wielding the authority of the inscrutable, this alliance between finance and digital tech leads to a dramatic restoration of corporate power and elite profit. Though this trend towards oligarchy is not a novelty, and the golden decades of freedom and democracy in the West were also coterminous with gender and racial oppression at home and colonial violence and aggression abroad, it has found a renewed intensity as the capital accumulated in industrial advanced countries scores the globe for lower age wages, preventing the development of the so-called peripheral formations and thus reappearing as the racial threat of cheap labor from the global south. As social rights wither in Europe and US, a massive security apparatus is in the process of being consolidated to manage this supposed, supposed or alleged civilizational threats to the nation. Under the banner of security, and now, like presently, against the background of Israel's war on Gaza, framed as anti-antisemitism, meaning the uh, necess necessity of combating antisemitism, the policing of racialized lives at home converges with the renewed intensity of colonial violence abroad, instituting a structure of affect that leads those who are hurt economically to invest themselves nonetheless, libidinally and symbolically. Millennials in particular are nudged to align their identities with startups and social media platforms, much as their parents did with the American dream and upward mobility and to misrecognize the entrepreneurial modes of subjectivity they engender as evidence of freedom and autonomy. Whiteness, one could say, functions as the libidinal glue that holds this wealth of incongruities together. The online cultural wars are a proxy for a greater battle about white loss and imperial hegemony, in which tech culture adopts the attitude of the hacker counterculture while aligning itself with the dominant class, thus opening a poisonous conduit between the two. I just wanted to share like a little image, like, a, a, well, the very famous image of what Elon Musk, uh, you know, like entering the Twitter offices with a sink uh, when he said, let it sink in, that he had just bought Twitter, because of course this was like a massive loss, like from a business perspective, he lost a lot of money. Uh, this was, of course, not the point. He bought Twitter in order to uh, create a political project. And in the anti-political atmosphere of post-89, a great deal of intellectual effort was devoted to conceptualizing political emancipation in a manner that evades the stubbornly persistent questions of party organization and militancy. In this retreat from the collective and embrace of the new, there has been a tremendous amount of exuberant and nominally left academics, sometimes with chairs paid for by tech companies, rave about the radical potentials of new media. The alt-rights proved appealing to liberal pundits, vast segments of the para-academia and contemporary art milieu because, owing to a vulgar reading of the laws and the lesionism, hybridity, ambivalence, and the performity are taken to be, by definition, polysemic, hence anti-authoritarian, while social media expression and virtually everything which can be described as rhizomatic or disruptive is fetishized as a form of network-enabled democracy. Perhaps most importantly, these same circles share a widespread disaffection with what is usually described as the culture of defeat that characterized the left understanding of its own political history since the fall of the Berlin Wall. Forsaking militancy in favor of melancholy and the fittest introspection, the left, according to its critics, 
often those who are nominally but not politically left-wing, lapsed into a kind of malaise and ultimately settled for a paradoxical stand of left traditionalism, abandoning every visionary project and by extension, voiding itself of libidinal energy. So the intensity or intoxicating vitality an almost ecstatic mode of experience that this left is set to lack is what the alt-right has to offer. But though often associated with a theme of conflict with the social order, which defines the counterculture, and that is uh, what people like Elon Musk, Musk embody, the desire to subvert or transgress moral codes does not necessarily have a politics. It is rather contingent to the current consensus. The rhetoric of transgression can also be largely unmoored from the politics a ready-made outlet for fantasies that link power to sexuality, like dominance and submission or sadomasochism. Social democracy had, and in many ways still has, a fascist libido, erotically speaking. Here, and in a great many examples, like the Manson family being the most extreme, transgression swiftly curls into sadism. In the field of contemporary art, at least, transgression is a genre which produced most cynical attempts to render aesthetic experience a direct extension of moral outrage. And just to give a couple of examples, for instance, this is like a um, supporter of Trump, Donald Trump uh, using the uh, uh, Pepe the Frog meme to mock the Black Lives Movement. So basically to the great and the mean, the call for respect for black, li black lives by, uh, you know, like um, uh, sporting a, a poster that says that green lives matter. Of course, you know, like green lives don't exist. Most importantly, transgression has an economic dimension correlated to the doctrine of creative destruction or what Silicon Valley vernacular, in Silicon Valley vernacular is called disruption, a pivotal theme in the nexus between the counterculture and tech or computer culture. Because from a neoliberal perspective, collectivity is by definition on illiberal. And what I mean by this is this is like a, a very age honored theme uh, you know, like in the way liberalism narrates itself, you know, like it goes back to Adam Smith and David Ricardo, this idea that, uh, you know, like if you do something for others, uh, you know, like this action must be, um, you know, like due to coercion, because of course, like the basic human need, uh, the basic human motive is selfishness and everybody at all times acts of selfishness. So, you know, like any kind of action that is worn out of compassion must have some sort of coercion in its background. So, um, because from a neoliberal perspective, collectivity is by definition a liberal, online connectivity promised to function as emancipatory uh, and as an emancipatory avenue able to bypass the pitfalls of collectivity organized action. But the nihilistic potential of the network is, as Joe Didin notes, a product of his individuating effects. Network-based interaction is also particularly apt at decoupling revolt from revolution. Though not identical to the counterculture, cultic cultures are also by nature oppositional, defined by their adherence to prescribed or forbidden knowledge, ideas, theories and speculations. Seekership arises from and in turn reinforces the consciousness of deviant status. By conflating cultural and political deviancy, the cultic milieu provides easy passage into the fascist forum. And by this I mean, and I don't know whether you're familiar with this, but um, you know, like the rise of fascism in Europe in recent years, 
has been connected to the rise, uh, you know, like of what I would call a cultic milieu surrounding like the anti-vax movement. So like the denial to take on the public vaccine. Digital, digitally born conspiracy theories, as Peter Knight argues, are less a sign of mental delusion than an ironic stance towards knowledge and the possibility of truth operating within the rhetorical terrain of the double negative. They are now presented self-consciously as a symptom that includes its own building diagnosis and whose rhetorical function is not to express conviction, but rather to signal ubiquitous cynicism and generalized distrust. This position is coextensive with the anti-politics of the professional managerial class and its ambivalence vis-a-vis -vis the rise of fascism. Willing to surrender political power to populists and demagogues of the far right in order to protect its economic interests, the affluent or relatively affluent Western middle classes also have an ambivalent relation to capitalism, typically theorized as an aleatory and chaotic force able to unleash powerful utopian energies whose alienating effects can be experienced as liberating. So almost all the figures in the alt-right define themselves as libertarians politically and white supremacists ideologically. The same holds true for neo-reactionary ideologues, albeit in a rather more coded fashion. This recurring contiguity points to an intellectual, to an ideological affinity it is distorted by geopolitical imperatives. It is not so much that neo-fascists are crypto-libertarians, rather, libertarianism is crypto-fascism, crypto-fascist, but its anti-democratic tendencies were somehow obscured by the popularization of revisionistic history in the last decades of the 20th century. And what I mean here, is that not enough attention is being paid to the fact that, uh, you know, like the economies of fascism, the economies like, for instance, of national socialism in Germany, uh, stemmed from the ordo liberal school that immigrated to the United States after the uh, World War II and became the Chicago school. The tale of the two totalitarianisms which posits a political and moral equivalence between Stalinism and National Socialism or fascism, in contradistinction to the anti-state politics of libertarian-inspired individualism, played a huge role in obscuring the kinship between libertarian and fascist doctrine. Whereas the Cold War trope of the free world versus totalitarian states subsumed the question of democratic government and turned it into an epic battle between the forces of freedom that were leonized by the likes of Ayn Rand, Friedrich Hayek, or Ludwig von Mises, and, and freedom, conflating democracy with liberalism. But democratic self-governance -gover is not a necessary part of a liberal social order. On the contrary, Classical liberalism does not support the idea of inalienable rights. Friedrich Hayek famously said he favored a liberal democracy, sorry, a liberal dictatorship when professing his support for Pinochet's coup in Chile. The fundamental norm of classical liberalism for social institutional structures is consent, which, as David Ellerman argues, leaves open the possibility of a voluntary constitutional form of non-democratic government in which the people have voluntarily agreed to alienate and transfer the rights of self-government to some sovereign. From Hobbes to Rawls, one finds manifold arguments for consent-based alienation of self-governing rights. In the context of the US, this debate is often tied to the issue of voluntarily slavery contracts. For the comparable, comparable question about an individual is whether a free system will allow him or herself to sell him 
or herself into slavery? I believe that it would. And this is the opinion of like the libertarian economics, Nozick, or as another libertarian economic Samuelson would put it, since slavery, since slavery was abolished, human earning power is forbidden by law to be capitalized. A man is not even free to sell himself. So back to Ellerman's uh, Ellerman arguments, uh, argument, the key, question, the key question here is the question concerning alienation versus delegation of rights, not the question of consent versus co coercion. Most contemporary libertarians defend the alienation of power to a sovereign rather than the citizen's delegation of power to representatives. A new Austrian economist typically championed non-democratic sovereign city-states, the so-called startup cities or charter cities. Libertarian models of consent based non-democratic municipal or state governments include the notion of free cities or startup cities, proprietary cities, or what Patty Friedman called floating seasteads city, city cities. Paul Romer also theorized charter cities or shareholder cities, all of which see the resident subjects as having agreed to a pact and subjections as evidenced by their voluntary decision to move to and remain in the city or state. All of these cases preclude any possibility of democratic participation in government. When or if consent is withdrawn, the only available option is exit. Neo-reaction, which is the ideology that is the brainchild of Nick Land and Urbit owner Curtis Yarvin, who is also known as Mensa's Mobook, typically champions opt-in societies or so-called gov corps that are ideally run by a CEO king. Though they do not identify as neo-reactionary, Balaji Srinivasan, Peter Thiel, and Patty Friedman, by the way, Patty Friedman is the grandson of Milton Friedman, also advocate opt-ins that restrict citizenship rights to investors, stockholders, bearing stakeholders from representation. Under the Gulf Corp model, the state will no longer regulate capital it will become capital's unfettered expression. So neo-reactionaries are in a way classic libertarians. They do not want to limit the power of the state, they want to privatize it. Instead of democratic rights, people would have the right to leave. Land, for instance, effectively rejects the democratic concept of political representation, that is, of having a voice arguing the only meaningful right is the right to exit. Ex exiting, however, implies segregation. The whole concept hinges on leaving others behind. Comparable to capital strike, which means the withholding of new invest in an investment in an economy, a concept which was popularized by Ayn Rand's novel Atlas Shrugged, whose plot involves a socialist United States in which the most creative industrialist scientists and artists respond to the demands of the welfare state by going on strike, retreating to a mountainous either way where they build an independent free economy. Exit is the formal version of what is informally, informally known as white flight the migration of white middle-class populations to more rational, racially implemented areas. The Valley is also heavily invested in Bitcoin, a technology whose social and political function, as David Columbia argues, far outstrips its techno technical function. Economically speaking, Bitcoin is the answer to the wrong question. The problems with value fluctuations are not formal, but political. They cannot be solved by software engineering. 
without direct regulations, regulatory structures, any financial instrument can be used as an investment. Ideologically, however, Bitcoin reflects deep-seated anxieties about foreign control of the Federal Reserve and more broadly, an anti-Semitic creep marked by the putative, Ill, putative illegitimacy or unnaturalness, unnaturalness of financial capital. So the question is not so much, in my view, whether the new far right is fundamentally fascist or non-fascist, but rather how this new face of fascism forces us to rethink the articulation of fascism and collectivism. Because fascism does not actually necessitate mass movements, it is a corporatist doctrine, not a collectivist one. Though the historical iterations of fascism, which came to power in the early 20th century, enjoyed a considerable amount of popular support, the outright ongoing attempts to mobilize the traditional far right remain intensely superstructural. Corporatism is an organicist doctrine. Society is represented as an organism, the social body. Unlike Marxism, corporatism does not narrate the structure of social antagonisms along class lines. Instead, it insists on the harmonious relations between brain and limbs, that is between employers and employees, and pits both together against an external or parasitical element which feeds on the social body. In classical fascism, this parasitical element is typically depicted as finance and personified as the Jew. Under neoliberalism, however, the position of the parasite has often been imputed to the state itself as a placeholder for the unworthy, racialized welfare beneficiaries whose undoubted taxes sap corporate productivity. In Europe and the United States, the question of taxation is increasingly tied to the racist refusal, refusal to pay taxes, largely seen, seen as supporting racialized minorities. And by exiting, you can shed the parasites, leaving them behind. So the non-identity between class consciousness and mass, mass movements hinges on the contradiction of why, on the on the construction of whiteness, on the structure of affect that leads those who are hurt economically to invest themselves nonetheless. But there is a clear tension between the political position represented by new reaction, which see whiteness as a proxy for capital, and those represented by the alt-right, which see capital as a proxy for whiteness. So rather than embracing the traditional far-right doctrine, neo-reaction believes that the genetically self-filtering elite is already in the process of divorcing itself from those of average and below average intelligence in a process that will ultimately lead to a transhuman super race and to a powerful leader making use of intelligence enhancement technology to put himself in an unassailable position. Now, though a transhuman hyper race might seem thus far unlikely, existing technology is already immersing us in the radical disruption proffered by the civil libertarian doctrine. Just think how the gig economy skirts the social contract. In a recent article for Salvage magazine, Harrison Fluss and Landon Freen addressed the friction between these diverging pools as a struggle between the competing animal spirits, the behemoth and the leviathan. Whereas the behemoth represents the territorial integrity of ethno-nations, the leviathan represents what Carl Schmitt called corsair capitalism, the fluid dynamism of trade and finance, better, no better known now as the towering figure which appears in the copper plate engraving of Hobbes Leviathan, as an emblem for the state or the rector, the ruler, the Leviathan was originally a dangerous or malevolent force, at times the sea itself, at times a dragon or devil, represented as a sea monster or serpentine whalefish. According to Schmidt, Ob shows this title due to the image it evokes, 
of a huge, gigantic body, the body politic, which obs opposed to the behemoth, a cipher for social unrest or revolution, the anarchic energies of the state of nature. Schmidt, on the other hand, returns to, the, returns to a Kabbalist interpretation to posit the Leviathan as a symbol of the sea and sea powers, fighting the behemoth that represent land powers. For Schmidt, the Leviathan stood for the Thalassocratic power of the British Empire, which he contrasted to the earthbound German Reich. But rather than antagonistic forces, Behemoth and Leviathan could be constructed as the different facets of the same political body. See, for instance, Saudi Arabia, which is at once a racial autocracy and a financial powerhouse. As the high seas have given way to cyber crimes, as the dynamic sites of accumulation, the Leviathan, to paraphrase first Hughes and Prim, could be said to represent an accelerated form of capitalism in the process of abolishing the historical factors that the behemoth, which are the, the historical factors that is the behemoth, which originally allowed it to flourish. Hence the frogs. Hence the obsession with vicious creatures and Lovecraftian teams. Liberal animals stand at the intersection between two different ent entities. They are Cartesian boundary beings whose morphology is metaphor incarnate. Deviancy, reversal of hierarchies, or dissolution of order are all hypothesized onto the jelly like amphibian body a stand-in for the liminal experience the whole planet is undergoing. To paraphrase M. S. César in the Giza Constitution, what in Europe is called fascism is just colonial violence finding its way back home. Fascism is and has always been the dirty secret of capital. It always prefers to approach its subjects through terror than through wage relations, contracts or markets, and before becoming its victims, white Europeans were always its accomplices. They tolerate it, absolve it, shut their eyes to it, legitimize it. So whereas Silicon Valley billionaires build doomsday bunkers in New Zealand, which is said to be the country better equipped to withstand the coming environmental collapse, social democracy is in the process of accommodating a fascist project by addressing certain groups of people biopolitical, biopolitically managing and gendering their lives, whilst other groups are submitted to a necropolitical regime, suppressed, deported, criminalized, and ultimately killed or left behind to die. So in 2003, Frederick Jameson famously said that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. By ontologizing social form, the organicist metaphor corporatism is based on implies that the crisis of said form is a crisis of society and civilization itself. Lifestyle is here equated with survival. As a result, for a vast part of the mostly white and relatively affluent population, unburdened by centuries of persecution, the end of the world is, unconsciously or semi-consciously, preferable to the end of the privilege afforded by racial capitalism. Thank you for your attention. I'm done. Hello, someone there? 提问环节，想请问现场的嘉宾有没有想要做出回应的？ OK。那么，请。先请的观众朋友们，有没有想问安娜的问题？可以直接举手示意。如果没有的话，那我们就直接来到slideo上的问题。好，这里我们有收集到一个问题，呃，请安娜来回答。这个问题是这样的：硅
Uh, well, that's a, I mean, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, I don't think no one has. Uh, one of the discussions like that I've been finding with great, in, uh, been following with great interest is this, you know, there's like a, a, an attempt to stir panic over, uh, you know, like artificial intelligence now. And a lot of people from the industry have been doing the rounds, you know, like in uh, TV channels, like giving interviews saying like artificial intelligence is going to bring out, uh, bring about this extinction of humanity. This is happening because open source artificial intelligence has been very effective. So, you know, it's a monopoly question. They want to have regulation in place so that they can uh, prevent open source uh, artificial intelligence to develop from developing. And uh, of course, if they succeed, then, uh, you know, like this is going to be a resource that is going to be privately owned in the future. Uh, if they do not succeed, and if you have like open source artificial intelligence, then you can finally start to socialize the technology, and then you can reverse these tendencies. Uh, at the present moment, clearly, there's a tendency for a accumulation of technological resources in the hands of a group of people that have like a very explicit political ideology and a very explicit political program. Again, you know, like when Elon Musk bought, uh, you know, Twitter, uh, you know, like, of course, this was like, uh, you know, like a, a really stupid bet, economically speaking, because he lost a lot of money. Uh, that's ever not the point. The point is that you wanted to create a tool to implement like an ideological program, which is exactly what he's doing. Uh, so, you know, like from that perspective, you know, like this investment pays off. All right. <clears throat> so, yes, again, you know, like I cannot give you a, a yes or no answer because it really depends on, you know, like how governments respond to it and what kind of legislation is imposed. Okay, you have uh, equated or conflated Elon Musk with the counterculture in your earlier statements. I would like to know your justification for that. I mean, you know, like it's it's a bit sarcastic, obviously, uh, but uh, you know, like the entire mythology of Silicon Valley, or like the way they, uh, you know, like um, represent themselves uh you know like kind of like uh draws from like countercultural tropes uh also historically you know like the new new communalist movement that led to the rise of Stuart brand and the whole earth catalog uh basically has roots in the counterculture even though you know like you could say that uh you know it ended up distorting the cult the culture culture or perverting it up to the point where it becomes unrecognizable uh but still there is an historical trajectory there that i think uh it's still kind of mobilized especially in terms of like uh you know like again the way silicon valley mystifies its own its own origins thank you Well, I would sort of follow what what B said that uh, you know Elon Musk, who's a South African who moved to Silicon Valley. Um, I mean, the the Bay Area has also lots of military origins and big companies and all sorts of things. I guess I don't see the it. I, I also don't really see the connection between the counterculture and some of the more. Um, you know, alt-right type or libertarian voices in Silicon Valley today. I mean, it seems like a very, very, very difficult thread to draw, if you could say a little more about it. Well, um, I, sorry, now I'm hearing myself again. Uh, it, can we fix the echo problem, maybe? Um, uh, th there is, of course, like... Um, Again, like an historical trajectory there, because uh, you know, like when 
you uh, had the new communalist movement, uh, you know, like uh, basically like uh, a movement that moved to the mountains in Northern California uh, and started up like this kind of communal living. Uh, that was the movement that also like gave rise uh, to, you know, like this form, like this budding forms or incipient forms of like, uh, you know, like the well, for instance, like this kind of like very proto or, yeah, like, let's say proto form of like internet communication. Um, and they have like clear uh, roots in the counterculture. About like the uh, um, alt-right, I think that what you have there is, uh, you know, like, uh, um, a moment in which it becomes clear that uh, politically speaking, uh, you know, like this type of like cultural countercultural formations uh, are not aligned with a left wing project, but actually with a libertarian project. And this is something that becomes apparently, uh, you know, like over time is not something that just happens all at once, uh, but, uh, you know, like becomes to um, give rise to a distortion of this idea uh, of transgression, you know, like, so like this uh, very cultural, countercultural or left-wing notion, or, you know, like you can even trace it back to 68 and the student movements of 68. Um, and the notion that you have to transgress, you know, like cultural forms and cultural codes uh, that gets entangled with the idea of like uh, disruption, you know, like in economical terms, uh, that is also like an idea that, uh, you know, like was first foregrounded by the order liberal school and then taken up by like the Chicago school and the Chicago boys. And uh, uh, that is kind of expressed in this kind of like slogans, like move fast and break things, right? Uh, and the uh, idea there is that, uh, you know, like you can uh, basically uh, mobilize, you know, like counter-cultural culture, uh, idioms that are cultural in nature and, uh, you know, like employ them or deploy them in an economical manner or in an economical form. Uh, and, uh, you know, like, uh, in terms of the alt-right, uh, you know, like, there's an aesthetical expression to this idea of disruption and to this idea of transgression. Uh, and these ideas like disruption and transgression are also, like, traditionally aligned with the left-wing project or had been traditionally aligned with an alt-wing, um, with a left-wing project even the idea of irony or sarcasm you know like uh you know like the challenge to figures of authority this challenge to established notions uh is something that had been traditionally aligned with the left however and uh you know like of course this is like my own personal opinion ever since the left won the cultural wars uh you know like this theme of transgression kind of like moved you know like to the right of the political spectrum and it became became a tool uh that is now used uh you know like uh not uh you know like by left-wing movements but by right-wing movements not sure if i answered your question yeah, another way that